Hello sports fans. Here we are in section six of chapter one. We're going to be talking about the uses and misuses of statistics. Mainly what I find interesting is how people abuse the statistics and make it say what they want to say it. So on your notes it says there are many ways in which statistics can be misused to sell products that don't work, to attempt to prove something that's not true, or to get our attention by a using statistics to evoke fear, shock, and outrage. I like the quote in the book that says, figures don't lie, but liars sure do figure. There's a comedian, Stephen Wright, and he said 47.3% uh, of all statistics are made up on the spot, <laughs> meaning like the one he just said was made up. And, I mean, that can be true. I, it's, it's, it's just really amazing what people do in order to influence others uh, in the guise of saying this is mathematics. Um, one of the things I read, it said G-I-G-I, or G-G, garbage in, garbage out. So the first area is suspect samples. And um, if you use very small samples, you are not going to get a very good representation of the population at large. And they also can pick their subject in a way that will bias the results. If you pick all skinny people, and then uh, try to do a weight loss product or something like that, it, uh, it can really affect it. Opinion poll. If you send an opinion out, sometimes those who only feel strongly respond. I mean, people who say, yeah, I could go either way on it, they don't respond. Convenience sample. It's not representative of the whole population. One of the articles I read said perhaps the most important thing to check is sample size and margin of error. It is often the case that with small samples, a change in one sample or one data item can completely change the results. Small samples can sometimes be the only way to get analysis done, but generally the bigger the sample size, the more accurate the results, and the less likely a single error in sampling will affect the analysis. For example, people who who will go on about how 95% of children have passed their exams at a school and 92% passed at a different school, uh, at, at a different one, but the sample sizes are not big. If it's 100 kids, 3% difference is only three students. And that's why, like, even with our EOCs here, we have a small sample size, so it's hard for us. You can also, you also have to use your common sense for statistics. It says uh, a technology firm discovered that 40% of all sick days were taken on Monday and Friday. Well, duh, -huh, there's only five days in the week. There's only five days in the week, and so 40%, oh, look what they just did. Sorry about that. I don't know why it does that. Pardon me. But anyway, they, they, they said they're going to crack down on those people taking sick on Friday and Monday. But it's actually, you know, there's five days in a week. So each day is 20% of the work week. Anyhow, that, but that's how people um, get all messed up with their statistics. They don't use their common sense. Fundamental to the mathematics of probability is the requirement of conditional probability. If they are not independent, the math stops working and the answers stop making sense. The gambler who thinks his luck must change soon because he couldn't continue to have bad luck all night is wrong. There's nothing to say that the dice should start rolling his way based on previous behavior because it's an independent event. But people get these, we're kind of uh, superstitious in our nature. One of the studies uh, that came out was that women were better drivers than men. But, you know, the thing is, very few people, they looked at the accidents that were reported to insurance, but most, uh, most of the uh, people out there would not bother to alert their insurers if they clip the wing or scratch the paint or they have some minor, in, minor um, damage to their car because they don't want their rates to go up. So, you know, it can be very misleading. This was another one. Toddlers who attended preschools exhibit aggressive behavior. Well, they did a study on four-year-olds and compared them, and they found, well, actually, four-year-olds are when kids start getting aggressive. And um, they said that the when they actually examined the study, a follow-up survey done by another group demonstrated that the children who stayed at home before attending school ended up being more aggressive at a later age than those who had gone to preschool. So they, the ones that did the first study were the mothers.
of the support group, mother support group. They use statistics to promote their own predetermined agenda, and that's what a lot of people do. That's why in this course, one of the important things is I want you to be able to determine whether the study is actually true or not. This in, il illustrates the first rule with dealing with statistics. Always ask who's paying for the study. Um, and things to look out for. Where did the data come from? Who ran the survey? Do they have an ulterior motive for having the result go one way? How was the data collected? What questions were asked? How did they ask them? Who was asked? Be wary of comparisons. Two things happening at the same time are not necessarily related, though statistics can be used to show that they are. That's cause, correlation does not mean causation. That's the term for that. This is a trick used by a lot of politicians wanting to show that a new policy is working. Be aware of the numbers taken out of context. This is called cherry picking, an instance in which the analysis only concentrates on data that supports a foregone conclusion. I liked this article that I read, and I was, I'm putting those things in, your, in here just for your information. So some of the things to uh, look out for, this is under the same heading. If they talk about road accidents with cars with a certain brand of tires, a lot of times they rig it. They only put the tires on, they put brand new tires on brand new cars, which older cars are the ones that are more likely to be in an accident. Check the area covered by a survey linking p nuclear power plants to ca cancer. The survey may have excluded sufferers who fall outside a certain area or have excluded perfectly healthy pers people living inside the area. You have to be careful about all that stuff. Now, the next one on your notes is how ambiguous averages can be used to misuse st statistics. They could use the median, mode, or mid-range instead of actual average to support their position. Basically, the average doesn't exist. The mean is a mathematical term, but average is a loose term where they can actually use anything they want. The mean, the actual mean, the median, mode, or mid-range. So this was in that same article. The main thing statistics shows is that there's no such thing as an average. If 50% of the company's employees are above average in productivity, then 50% must be below average. Changing the definition will not help. 50% will always be below it, as demonstrated in bell curve graphs. This demonstrates another problem people have in interpreting statistics. Many people try to make their statistics fit the normal distribution, the bell curve, but there are non-normal distribution where the humps are to the left or to the right. And the statistics, I cannot say that word today. Statistics used for normal are often inappropriate when the distribution is patently non-normal. Many people think mean is the same as average. It doesn't. Mean is a math term. Average is often used for a description of a person data item, personal or data item. So they talk about mean, median, and mode there where you already know it. But here's some example data. If you look here, the mean is representative of the data, 7.71. But look at this data set too. You have 4, 5, 5, 5, 8, 12, 86. 86 is way over there. 17 is to the right of 12. There's only one number that's above the mean. So that's what they're saying with uh, the averages. Be careful with that because it depends on the data. You might have what's called an outlier, which we'll get to later in the course. Describe how changing the subject might be another way to distort statistical data. Different values used to represent different the, the same data. For example, they give the politician. He said, oh, spending only increased by 3%. And the other politician says, he increased spending by $6 million. Well, the $6 million sounds like a whole lot, but out of the whole budget, it's only 3%. So that's how you could use the different kind. Detached statistics can be used to misrepresent data. There's no comparison made. Our chips have half the fat. Of what, you ask? I mean, they, you see these on stuff all the time. This brand works four times faster for headache medicine. Well, then what? That's the question. So there's no comparisons there. Describe how connections might be implied that may not actually exist. They inject phrases or words into claims like may help or up to or suggest or some. So all of those weight loss videos and that, you can lose up to 10 pounds a day. Well, they might have had one guy 
weigh himself with a weight in his pocket and then weigh himself without the weight in his pocket the next day. You just never know. Describe how graphs can be drawn inappropriately. This one is so powerful because gra it's a visual thing. They can change the scale to exaggerate certain points. Using the wrong type of graph for a certain type of data is the other thing that can be used. So let's do, uh, it says don't be fooled by graphs. Scale can be manipulated and um, really different colors and everything else. The, the one that I read about was um, that a chewing, com chewing gum company wanted to show that chewing gum increases saliva. The chart showed the increase in danger to the gums after eating in red and safe time after chewing in blue. However, the chart showed that the act of chewing would have to go on for 30 minutes to take the line out of the danger zone. The curve was just colored in a clever way to make make it look like the effect was faster. Here's a, a couple of graphs. If you look, this first one, family income, they go from 84,000 to 92, and they look all about the same. But look what happens if I stretch that scale out. Instead of going up by $2,000, which is uh, appropriate, they go up by $500. And look how, wow, this family is just making so much more than everybody else. But they're not. They're only making about $2,500 more a year than these families over here. So that's how what I mean by scale. Here's a one with a pie chart. It looks like item C is about the same size as item A, but if you look at the regular pie chart, this is only 5% and that's 11%. So actually the blue is twice as big as this guy, over twice as big. This guy with the improper scaling with pictograms, that's a very powerful one. It looks like this B is like nine times as big, but really it's only three times as big. Very, very powerful. Home sales, 3D graphs, the effect is cubed. From 2000 to 2001, home sales were flat, very little. But this pictograph makes it look like, wow, there's a big difference because it's in three dimensions. I don't know why I have 20,011, but oh well. Uh, misleading. So look at the different scales here. They made the cherries real small. These were all equal. Here's what the regular graph should look like. So the bananas here look a lot longer. And you know what they say about long bananas. Anyhow, but they should all line up there. So I just want to give you an idea of how scale affects it. Here's the truncated bar graph, and you can see the difference between the data. It looks very significant, but that's because they changed the scale to go up by 100. Here, if it goes up by 2,000, they all look equal. Survey questions can be used in questionnaires to influence the way people answer them. The way the question is worded can affect the way people interpret what you're asking. For example, they say, would you like a new school in your neighborhood so that class sizes are smaller? Well, who wouldn't want that? You'd say yes. But if they said, um, would you like a new school and have your taxes increase so that you're paying an extra $100 a month, people might say no, because we don't have an extra $100 a month to go to taxes. So that's the example they gave in your book. And a lot of times they, they, they do that. They say, wouldn't it be nice if there were no hungry children in the world? And you say, yes, well, then donate this much money. And you go, well, uh, no, I don't have that money. Um, a, serious, a more serious problem was highlighted in a court case where an innocent man was accused of being at a crime scene, which he denied, but was, was facing fingerprint evidence. A fingerprint expert was presented in the court who asked, assuming that the defendant did not commit this crime, what's the probability that the defendant and the culprit having I of the defendant and the culprit having identical fingerprints. And the expert said one in several billion. So that makes him look guilty. But if he asks how many, what's the probability that the fingerprint lifted from the crime scene would be wrongly identified, oh, about one in a hundred. Well, that's possible in people's mind. It's possible. So the guy ended up um, getting, um, not being convicted by that. And uh, some, you know, statistics can be used to create unusual mental games and in, with interesting answers. They can be great conversation starters at parties because of the crazy stuff that comes out. So just wanted to give you an idea of uh, statistics and some of the misuses. I will see you tomorrow.